Hello, and welcome to Rock Your Block, where we celebrate the architects of change in our communities. I'm your host, Larry Laws. And today, in honor of Women's Empowerment Month, we highlight a remarkable leader whose influence transcends the ordinary. Betty is not just a beacon of wisdom and empowerment. She's a human de development consultant and a voice of reason in discord of our times. Her journey is a testament to the power of faith, perseverance, and unwavering commitment to community impact. At the heart of Betty's mission lies B. Walker Consultants, LLC, a vessel for her to connect, inspire, and empower individuals across various sectors, be it through legal support, corporate governance, or office administration. But in her work with the BASIC project, where her passion for mental health, advocacy, and conflict resolution truly shines. Demonstrating her holistic approach to human development, Betty's educational path crowned by a master's degree in human services counseling. Alongside her diverse professional background, from graphic design to ministry, illustrating a life dedicated to serving others. Her story is one of resilience, dedication, and profound belief in the transformative power of conversation. As we delve into our discussion, let's draw inspiration from our guest's unique journey, insights, and her unwavering dedication to making a difference. Prepare to be inspired by a woman whose life embodies the essence of empowerment and leadership. Please welcome to our show, Miss Betty Walker. Betty, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. Yes. Well, I want our audience to get to know a lot about you and to okay. get to know to you, get to know you. Please uh, tell us a little bit about the journey. Where did it start? Oh my goodness. Um, well, first of all, I'm a resident and um, of Virginia. Um, I started out uh, as a military. Um, my father was in the military, uh, a, a military uh, police officer. Yes. Um, and um, you know, when I as a child, I started out, um, you know, traveling a lot with my family. Um, at the time, my brother wasn't born. He was actually born in Italy, yes. uh, which was the last tour duty that my father had. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of my journey really kind of happened after all of that. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, that's really unique. I didn't know until just a few minutes ago <laughs> that she was a military brat. Yeah. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, growing up as a military brat, being, you know, trans, you know, you transition from place to mm -hmm. place. And a little bit about that. Um, it, it was, um, I would say, what was interesting about it for me was that as a child, you're not often, well, I wasn't uh, aware of some of the racial discrimination and bias that goes on in the world. I think my parents had a tendency to want to protect me from that. So it wasn't a conversation that I grew up having with my family and being aware of, of some of the challenges that were going on in the United States. Um, during the time, for the most part, I, you know, you're talking about from the time I was a baby on up until maybe nine years old. So yes. I was fairly young. And I don't think that for me, I really thought in terms of uh, what was going on in my surroundings. All I knew is that, you know, I had these parents and we were <laughs> traveling. And, you know, I remember um, uh, he was stationed in California at one point. I, I remember traveling on the roads uh, for Salt Lake City yes. and seeing the salt beds on mm -hmm. either side of the road. And it's what, probably changed by yes, now. What branch of service? He was in the, he was uh, um, in the Army, Army? U.S. Okay. Army, yes. uh, and as I said, he was a military police officer. Okay. For, he was a 20-year veteran. Okay, super. Yeah. Well, thank you for his service. Uh -huh. Yes. And so uh, at your earliest, uh, re remember, and I understand that you spent time in Italy, mm -hmm. and so what was the early years of uh, school once you, uh, you know, here stateside that you can remember? Uh, you're talking about after he retired and we came back to the yes. States? Um, what was interesting for me for that was, um, again, not being fully aware of uh, growing up doing segregation and Jim Crow. I had no concept of what that was like because I had not been exposed. You know, in the military, 
uh, you're exposed to a higher level of education, you're intermingling with all different types of children from different races and cultures and ethnicity. And so when you come back to the States and suddenly there's this separation between mm -hmm. whites and blacks and, you know, well, uh, when I even went to my um, parents' community, which is Newtown, um, it's part of Elton, Virginia, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that. Elton, Virginia is 18 miles east of uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia. <clears throat> For those who don't know where Harrisonburg is, it's, it's uh, the home of James Madison University. Yes. Um, and so coming back to um, the United States, I was sort of thrust into the middle of Jim Crow laws, Se you know, segregation between blacks and whites, you know, um, and I was immediately placed into a four room black schoolhouse. Okay. Um, and that was very, um, uh, I love the part of being with my people and, and being, cause I had never had that type of interaction before. Um, so I appreciated that, but the challenge that I ran into there with that was, um, and it, as a matter of fact that, um, Four Room Schoolhouse is a historic landmark now. Okay. And what, and what grade levels did they have there? Uh, I believe they had, um, I want to say from maybe mm, second or third grade up until maybe eighth grade. And then oh. the, the, it, when you got into your junior and senior years, you went to a school, a high school called Lucy Sims School, which was in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Okay. Um, but I think the thing that was very challenging for me was the educational component of it. Um, and because I was so far advanced in my educational training, <clears throat> my teachers didn't really know how to give, me, how to progressively move me forward in my education. So what they did is they held me back. They didn't teach me anything new for two years until segregation happened and I transitioned over into the all white schools. Well, we when at the point of integration. Yes, and yeah. so, uh, yes, yeah, so I experienced it earl earlier, um, mm -hmm. but it was a little bit later in, uh, during the century. And so what the grade level did you enter into the uh, integrated school system? Um, I I was in the sixth grade the sixth, when, okay. it, when we integ integrated. Um, and the challenge that I ran in there, again, as a child, you're not, aware of these things Correct. and I think <clears throat> that my parents <clears throat> weren't aware either to be able to influence but I had a uh, my uh, sixth grade teacher which is a well, white teacher happened to uh, mention to myself and my mother um, that they need that she wanted to be able to do some one-on-one -on -one training with me because I had ultimately become a slow learner as a result of that, of oh. not having been taught anything in the um, in the black school system for so long. Okay, and so while in the military, was you at any uh, elementary school at any time at, during that time while you were still serving in the military, in the military schools? Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Yes. Was there a difference in uh, uh, what was uh, in the, um, the group that you were in in the military versus mm -hmm. the group that you was with, your classmates as you was with outside the military? Um, as far as the, my interaction with them, you Inter mean? Yes. Um, my interaction was uh, different uh, in the context that, uh, again, you still had the racial component that was there. Um, <clears throat> as a child, I really didn't know what to make of it because I had not been exposed to that or really was aware. It was probably the more appropriate word. Um, and. Uh, so I did have, and this is part of something that I write about in the book that I'm working on now, is I talk about the challenges that I had with um, children who would make fun of me and call me the N-word and that type of thing and me not really comprehending what that was and yes. what that was about Correct. and having to have the conversation with my parents. So that was the difference when I went to the black school system there were no issues because we were Correct. all the same. Correct. Um, yes. What inspired yeah. you to actually seek higher education after high school? Well, first of all, I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to go to HBCU because I had, um, you know, once we got back, my, my parents came back to their hometown. Um, you know, I went to an all white um, uh, high school, you know, it was a junior and high school. 
Uh, and I had never really been outside of the black community that I was a part of. I had never really been exposed to my people. I wanted to really have a sense of my culture, yes. my ethnicity, because I felt like there was something missing in my life. And so I purposely wanted to select the HBCU, which I went to Norfolk State University. It was you know, Norfolk State College back in those okay. days, but now it's Norfolk State <laughs> University. Yes. And, uh, you know, since then, you know, of course, you're in, uh, in the profession and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that you do, mm -hmm. but you became a homeowner. Uh, so why not rent? Why did you uh, decide to purchase a home? Um, I, for me, I, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason was that my parents had never owned a home. You know, we'd always either been in military housing or when they, my, when my parents retired, we got, we were in, living in a mobile home. Wow. <clears throat> so we never really had, and I wanted to have that that sense of ownership, you know, to have something that was my own. And, you know, by that time, having worked and been out in the world, I understood that having a home was the one thing that had some value to yes. it. Um, and it was mine. And, I, you know, I had rented for many years as a young adult, um, but discovered that there are complications with having an apartment or, yes. you know, even a condo because, you know, yes. you've got neighbors that you have to deal with. Sometimes you don't have control of the heating and the, uh, the air conditioning. And so I just wanted something that was mine, that when I went through that front door, I didn't have to worry about contending with anybody else. Correct. Yeah. Now, you've been a homeowner. Did that motivate any of your other family uh, to maybe uh, pursue homeownership? Um, not necessarily. I think most of the people that I interact with either already had a home or they were working towards getting a home because they had that same mindset about having something that's your own. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I appreciate you uh, in, again being here today. And we're going to talk about maybe a challenge that was faced as a homeowner. Okay. Right after the break. Okay. Thank right. you. We're about to take a short break. But before we go, I would like to remind you that First Home Alliance is a HUD approved housing counseling agency serving the national capital area. If you are a first time home buyer or homeowner and need a mortgage assistance, please visit the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development website to find a HUD approved agency in your area. We'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned. Here with First Home Alliance. A little bit about First Home Alliance. We are a HUD approved housing counseling agency that was established in 2002 by our executive director, Larry Lowe. He established the nonprofit. He established it because his mother purchased her first home at the age of 65. And everyone was like, how did you do that? Because her income was really low. And so, that's how he found out about the USDA program. And so through the USDA program, his mother was able to purchase her first home and treat him to see how he could help individuals basically experience the American dream of home ownership. So he established the nonprofit. The mission is to increase uh, home ownership to low to moderate income families. And so what does First Home Alliance do? Welcome back. You're watching Rock Your Block. I'm your host, Larry Laws of First Home Alliance. And if you're just now tuning in, we're joined today with Betty Walker. Mm -hmm. Betty, before the break, we was talking about the, uh, you know, the, the, the journey to home ownership mm -hmm. and the pride of uh, actually uh, only owning your home. But um, tell us about a challenge that you had uh, while being a homeowner. Um, I, I came into uh, around 2013. I was working, I had worked for law firms for close to 15 years by that time. And um, my company through no, you know, nothing that had to do with me and my behavior or anything, but they went into financial uh, uh, challenges and they had to make some cutbacks. They had been doing it for maybe the last two or three years. Yes. And as they always say, last hired, first fired. <laughs> yes. So eventually it got up to me. You know, I was one of the newer people that had been, most of the people that had been there had been there for 10, 15 years, you know, where I had been there for about six and a half. Um, and so they made a decision to um, do a, do some lay, layoffs, reduction in force, 
Um, and it, it, it was a very interesting situation for me because of my approach to it. Um, and I remember being called into the, um, uh, the personnel office and the director of personnel at the time, and he had one of the attorneys in there because, you know, I guess you never, and you never know how people are going to respond. Right. <laughs> but um, because I understood how business runs, um, they were very nervous about it. And I think because they really liked me and they liked the work that I do, did there, they were very hesitant to have to give me, break that news to me. And so one of the things that I did when they were talking to me is to say, listen, guys, I understand you don't have to feel uncomfortable yeah. about this. You know, I, I know you need to do what you need to do to survive. Correct. Um, so I don't take this personally. And I think that it was just a sigh of relief for them that I took it that way. So uh, after that, um, it was very interesting because for me, um, it was like the first week in January 2013. So I had a series of events that happened the first week, the first three days of the first week in January. Um, I was um, the first, the, the first, I think it was the ninth, um, I, w I was accepted into Regent University, okay. you know, where I was applying for my human services counseling degree uh, on a graduate level, my master's degree. Um, on the next day, uh, I was uh, I was able to um, I did a refi refi on my home okay. and that was processed on that day. And then on the third day, I was let go. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was yeah. for refinance yeah. in Indianapolis. So, it, yes. you know, I, but because I'm a woman of faith, you know, I chose to believe God that I was going to, everything was going to be fine. They gave me a compensation package and all of that. Well, what happened is after exhausting the compensation money, exhausting unemployment, I found myself not able to get a job for four years. Wow. Um, and I spent two of those years trying to get back into legal. Well, by that time, I think I was 60 or something. And um, I, and even though th there's no evidence to support it, I think I was suffering from ageism. You know, yes. people have ways of knowing. And so I, I, I was very um, frustrated about it, very um, unnerved about it because I couldn't understand how do you not get a job back in which you've been doing for 15 years. Uh, and so uh, that was really, I think, the beginning of my processing of understanding how to really, sometimes you have to walk things out by faith, yes. even though you don't really understand the outcome mm -hmm. of whatever. And so the one thing I did not want to do, which I wound up having to do, was to go back, go into retail because, you know, there was that sense of pride that I had in myself is like, I've worked this career and this, you know, this long extensive work history and how dare I have to go into right. some, reduce myself to a retail. <laughs> so but it, it became an issue of like, you either take that or you, you, you know, you starve. And yes. so in the midst of all of that, um, I had a situation where my mortgage company, even though I had never missed any payments with my mortgage, they decided to foreclose on me because I had was, wasn't able to pay my bills yes. and no income. Um, and so that's how I got connected with First, uh, First Alliance. And part of that uh, processing was me lowering my pride to recognize that um, I'm in a desperate situation now. I have to not think about the embarrassment and yes. the shame that comes with it, but to recognize that I need help. I need to ask people and let them know wh what's happening to me. So I wound up talking to my pastor at the time, right. which is Pastor Keith Savage. Yes. Um, and he mentioned uh, First Home Alliance to me. Yes. And I'm so grateful, eternally grateful for that connection because um, through one of your... Um, employees, um, my home was saved. I'm still in that same home now. <laughs> well, that, that is great. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, and so that, that path to get to, uh, you know, to help in the community, mm -hmm. you know, it's, a lot, it's many out there today that are uh, facing situations that's from the pandemic and earlier was mm -hmm. mortgages, but also, you know, it's a lack of um, loss of income and other mm -hmm. crisis, but they don't know where to turn. Yes. But also you went to your, your pastor, yes. which is <laughs> which uh, a lot of respect for uh, Dr. Savage, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Keith Savage, who we've uh, worked with, uh, with him in reference to doing a lot of outreach in the community, mm -hmm. you know, for home ownership and also uh, uh, foreclosure prevention. So I really appreciate him being 
a person that yes. will um, recommend. Like a conduit. <laughs> yeah, a conduit, you know, <laughs> keeping us all together. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, so I remember him at one of our events um, uh, just smiling and always saying some good words. Yes. Yes. So, yes, well, we appreciate the the path brought you to to, uh, to us, to First Home Alliance, mm -hmm. because you, we do what we, we, I think that we are sent here to do. Mm -hmm. This is our mission, you know, mm -hmm. to preserve home ownership and also increase, increase home ownership. And so how, um, um, with that, uh, how do you feel about, uh, you know, your home now and continuously being a homeowner? Oh, I love it. You know, um, uh, in fact, I can't tell you how many people have called and asked me, are you willing to sell your home? I was like, are they crazy <laughs> with this economy? I'm not going right. anywhere. You know? yes. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, but I, I think that if I could say anything, particularly to your audience, I would say if you find yourself in those situations, don't be ashamed to reach out for help. You know, there's a lot of people that are going through similar challenges and it doesn't matter to what status, what station in life you're at. It happens to all of us, most of us, yes. uh, unless you have some, you know, other outlets of income coming in. Uh, in my case, I was single. Yes. Uh, and, you know, my, both of my parents are deceased now, so I didn't have any place to reach back to to yes. have help. And it was, you know, my friends um, that uh, when when I needed a little extra money to pay some bills, they helped me. Um, but it meant that I had to lower my pride and let them know I need some help. Can you help me? Yes. Um, yes. I do want to mention a couple other things. One, the basic project, you know, mm -hmm. that's something that you originated back in 1991, I think. Yes. You know, tell us a little bit about basic project. Yeah, the basic, uh, the basic project is an acronym for the Brothers and Sisters in Christ Project. And it was a revelation that God gave me back in 1990, I think July 1990, that I started. Um, and the vision behind it was I wanted to bring together uh, faith leaders from different states that we would then begin to do work within our communities in whatever capacity that uh, we were skilled in. So take for instance, at that time I wasn't involved in counseling, but um, I was really more into leadership development, which I still do a lot of yes. now. Um, and so my, the premise behind it was that each of us, we, you know, I had someone in Georgia, someone in California, someone in Michigan, and I was in Virginia. And the vision was to start a chapter in all of these uh, states and that each of us would then begin to find out what are the needs in our community and how could we help support people. Yes. Of course, unfortunately, <clears throat> a lot of the um, it was it w was wonderful. I used to have conferences and that type of thing. Uh, at some point, all of the people that I worked with started going through some personal traumatic challenges. Yes. Um, and, you know, we just kind of had to be at standstill for a while. But yes. we're still in existence. I'm just reinventing it now. OK. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we're going to uh, let people know how they can follow you and uh, some of the things that you're doing in the community. Mm -hmm. But before we uh, run out of time here, let's talk about the book. The first okay. one, Living a Purpose, The Journey. Yes. Uh, well, yes, tell us a little bit about um, writing that book. That was my first book, not my best work at that particular <laughs> point. Um, I started writing it really at the inspiration of something that the Lord wanted me. He was dealing with me about being transparent and being able to share my stories of um, my experiences growing up. Um, and I really wanted to share the story of the fact that I started writing this book without any having any skills. Uh, yes. I had no concept of grammar, no sentence structure. I didn't know anything about writing a book, but it was something, you know, that the Lord told me. So he gave me the title of it. Um, and then that's all he said to me for two years. So I remember crying over my computer. I was like, I can't do this. You know, this is, yes. this is too hard. But I, I, I'm here to, as a testimony to say that God can help you. You know, he was molding me into something that I couldn't even envision myself. Yes. And so that's what my book is. My first book is largely about is about my relationship with God and how he um, uh, how he motivated me to become a writer when mm -hmm. I didn't even have the skill sets to be one. Well, it's great. Betty, mm -hmm. I want to uh, tell you thank you for coming mm -hmm. on today. And it's been a pleasure. Uh, I may have to invite you back. Oh, because I'd you, love to come. <laughs> yes, to, to talk more about the consulting work that you're doing, mm -hmm. but also to share, you know, your uh, admiration, what you're doing next. I think yes. the audience would like to, to hear that. I'd love to come back. All right. Well, thanks for coming in today. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed this interview. 
and time spent with the amazing Betty Walker. It has been an honor to recognize her accomplishments while we celebrate Women's Empowerment Month. For more information about Betty, visit her website or you may connect with her on LinkedIn. In closing, I'm Larry Laws of First Home Alliance and it's been a pleasure sharing with you our mission and highlighting people in our community that are making a difference. If you have questions about financial fitness or how we can help make your dream of homeownership a success, email your question to our inbox at help at firsthomealliance.org. Then tune in to our next show to see if your question was selected to be shared with our audience. You can easily get more information about our services by visiting us our website and please follow us on Facebook. Thank you for watching today's segment of First Home Alliance and join us next time to rock your block. Glad to know that, you know, some of this stuff about like, I don't know, credit buying houses is like written down somewhere. A lot of the times it's always hearsay, like other friends or family members who have bought houses before, but they can never, you know, tell you legit what you need to get done and do before buying a house. I definitely think this class should be required for all first home buyers because um, a lot of times the real estate agent doesn't explain the process to you. So I think this is very important. Uh, it's from the credit up to receiving a loan. And the most important thing is the process that you go through when you're buying the house. And there are a lot of process which you don't have idea about that before you take this class. The speakers who came up and spoke about each section, they were very knowledgeable in their field and I felt like they it was relatable. They didn't just throw out a whole bunch of terms that went over my head, but they really explained it in in a way to where I you know, understood it and I could even explain it to my children and it was even easier for me to take home and kind of remember and, and process and, and apply to my next steps. Um, the process was amazing. They start first with a class before even finding a lender or agent. Because I did all that and I wasn't able to purchase and then I was like, oh, you know what, there's a lot of information I'm not aware of. Let me just start from the beginning to put everything on hold. Piecing the information together because you've heard things from about the loans and about this and about the credit, but this is like a summary and it just gives a clear flow of where to go with what you have and kind of building up a plan. So that kind of gives me a whole picture of where I needed to go and how to get there.